Welcome back. Uh, everybody settled? Drinks? Snacks? Let's begin. Chapter 4. I woke up in a burrow that seemed familiar to me, but my nose issued a red alert. Unfamiliar smells. I darted out into the open and looked around. I was in a strange cage. And then I remembered, oh yeah, I'd been sold. I was with Sophie and Gregory and Mom. How was I feeling? Terrific! I would show Mom I was in peak condition. That ought to kill off her proposal to take me back to the pet shop. Hello, Freddy. I looked up. Sophie was gazing down at me, fair-haired and smelling of fresh sunflower seeds. But what was this Freddy business? I thought I'd call you Freddy. You need a name. Do I? Very well. In that case, why not Freddy? It sounded fresh and frisky, like me. Very appropriate. I'll bring you something to eat in a minute. Then you can make yourself at home. Daddy says I've got to leave you alone until you've settled in. What a nice, kind, sympathetic family. Sophie! That was Mom from elsewhere in the apartment. Didn't I say you had to finish your homework before you play with the hamster? Yes, Mom. But Freddy just woke up. I want to feed him, that's all. Please do as I ask. That creature can wait. Some family members were less nice and kind than others, apparently. Yes, Mom, said Sophie. Then, in a low voice, don't worry, Freddy. I'll bring you something right away. That was twice Mom had butted, it, butted in, and she hadn't exactly endeared herself to me the first time. Although I was now hale and hearty, she seemed to have lost interest in my state of health. So be it. While I was waiting for my food, I could now inspect the cage. Sophie! Mom again. I wondered what was on her mind this time. Yes, Mom. I'm getting a migraine. I'm going to lie down in my room for a few hours. I don't want to be disturbed. Yes, Mom. A door closed. A migraine? It sounded like something that made you crawl into your burrow for a couple of hours because you didn't feel chipper. Right. Now for the cage. Looking around, I saw the inevitable tread wheel, but also a swing, a jungle gym, and a circular wooden disc that could obviously be rotated. A kind of a hamster's carousel? I would try it out later. My future physical fitness had been provided for anyway. Now for the litter. A brief experimental dig showed that it was sufficiently firm and deep enough to permit tunneling of various kinds. Next step, install a john. That was soon done. Now for my burrow. Having worn my way around inside, I discovered that it consisted of three chambers linked by passages. I wriggled out again and surveyed my new domain. It all belonged to me. To me, yes, to me, Freddy, no one else. There weren't any other golden hamsters around. I was the only golden hamster in the cage. yippity doo I leaped high into the air, turned one somersault, and then, because the first one had worked out so well, another. There you are, laughed Gregory. He's himself again, the way I said he would be. Too bad Mom didn't see that, said Sophie. They had walked up to this cage without me even hearing them, probably because I was too busy turning somersaults. If wild hamsters fail to hear something, the result, for them, is usually fatal. It's different with us domestic ham hamsters. That's why we can practice somersaults. Where's Mom, anyway? asked Gregory. Migraine, was all Sophie said. Gregory's face darkened. He said nothing. Daddy, can I let Freddy out? While well, I'll do my homework, I mean. Let me out? What was that supposed to mean? Oh, so you're calling him Freddy? That's a good name. It suits him somehow. Gregory just grinned. His full name could be Freddy Artis. Artis, that means golden in Latin. Freddy Artis. Freddy the Golden One. Hmm. No objections for me. It sounded pretty unique. Gregory couched down until his head was level with me. Shall we let you out, Freddy Arcus? Man, will someone explain what it means? All this talk about letting me out? Maybe it's too soon, said Gregory, straightening up. Tell you what, put the cage on the table. Objection, I said. Never move a golden hamster's cage. You could upset the neat piles of goodies in his burrow. And open the door. Then he can get out, said Gregory. Open the door of the cage? So I could silly get out? Out? But that means out of the cage? Yes, that was it! The significance of the words suddenly hit me. They meant nothing more nor less than this. The world was now my oyster. I was free! My yearning for release from captivity was beckoning me. 
Freddy Artis. You can come out if he wants to. You bet I want to, and how? But if he doesn't, leave him be, okay? If he doesn't go promenading on the table, though, be careful. He could nibble your school books. What gives you that idea, buddy? A Freddy on the loose would have better things to do than nibble on school books, believe me. Like what, for instance? Hmm, time would tell. On the other hand, it couldn't hurt to give the matter some thought. Or he might fall off the edge and break his neck. Ouch. That I could do without. I'd almost forgotten that a life of freedom wasn't without its lurking dangers. What was more, it lacked certain things a cage provided. A safe, snug burrow, for instance. Complete. Then Snoopy said, But first I should feed him, Daddy. Oh, you're one in a million. As I think I've already said. The food was a well-balanced mixture of lettuce, leaves, and grain. The only thing missing was some protein. A mealworm to cite for one example. Humans seldom, if ever, think of that. There seems to be an unbridgeable gap between our dietary requirements. I mean, I certainly wouldn't expect humans to grasp how tasty a mealworm can be, but they ought to be taught in kindergarten, if not before, that the little creatures are a valuable source of protein. Having eaten some of my meal and stowed the rest in one of my larders, I mentally prepared myself for freedom. To, the, to do this, I settled down comfortably in my burrow and shut my eyes. Then I envisioned an opening in the cage and pictured myself walking through it. I pictured my route to freedom step by step. And where did my last step take me? Back into my comfortable burrow. I opened my eyes. I had grasped the truth. A closed cage door meant captivity, but an open one didn't signify freedom. Far from it. There had to be some route to freedom other than an open cage door, and finding it, I suspected, would be difficult business. What lay ahead of me was merely an ex excursion into the world beyond the bars. A pleasure trip during which I might see something new, but nothing to get worked up about. I emerged from my burrow. Sophie picked up the cage, carried it over to the table, and put it down so gently that my meager stores were never in danger for a moment. Then she opened the door. I took no special notice of how she did this. A big mistake, as I discovered later. However, it seemed to be easy enough. I simply saw that the barred door had been folded down at an angle to form a kind of a ladder leading to the table. Well said Sophie. Are you coming out? What a question. Still, I couldn't help feeling a bit uneasy when I poked my head out. I drew a deep breath. It's only an outing, I told myself, so stay cool. Cautiously, I clambered down the bars of the cage door. One little hop onto the tabletop and was in the outside world. I looked back. The cage door, my line of retreat, was still open. The Golden Hamster's motto was when tun tunneling was, forge ahead into the darkness by all means, but make sure the route behind you is clear. With this in mind, I began to explore the world beyond the bars. For a start, because I was anxious to avoid breaking my neck, I tried to spot the edge of the table. No use. Unfortunately, golden hamsters don't have formidable sharp eyesight. In fact, the first person to market golden hamster sunglasses will make a fortune. So at first I remained within the immediate vicinity. I made a hard back book, Two notebooks, one of them open, and a number of pencils neatly arranged side by side. The table I was standing on seemed to be Sophie's desk. My razor-sharp senses also told me that Sophie had sat down at the desk and was holding one of the pencils in her hand. A voice in the distance. I asked not to be disturbed. Uh-oh, Mom again. She made a habit of butting in whenever I was being given food or starting to investigate something. Okay, okay, I I'm sorry. That was Gregory. I just wanted to see how you were doing. Thanks. You should know by now that these migraines are no fun. If John comes today, please go someplace else to talk. You two are always so noisy. For one thing, said Gregory, and you can tell how hard he was trying to keep his voice down, we're never noisy. For another, we're staying right here. I still have some things to discuss with him before I go on tour, and for that, I need my papers. So please, the door just closed, then silence fell. Sophie looked up. That was when I became aware that she'd sat there like a statue, hanging her head while her parents were arguing. She'd look a bit like one of us when we were scared stiff and play dead. I could sympathize. Young hamsters always find it immensely stressful when two adults fight for territory with their teeth. The contest doesn't end until one of them definitely proves to have the most powerful bite. In this case, considering the way things were between me and mom, 
I hoped Gregory would come out on top. But hamster fights also have a different outcome, which is that one of the rivals simply give up and quits the field of battle. Gregory had said something about going on tour. I guess that meant he would be away for some time, long enough for mom to proclaim herself the winner. That remained to be seen. Maybe humans and golden hamsters were different in this respect. As for the visit by this John person, I gave it no further thought. It would have been a waste of time in any case because I had no idea what I was in for. If I had known, I would have fled into my burrow like a streak of lightning and plugged the entrance until it was absolutely smell-proof. So there I sat on Sophie's desk, surrounded by pencils and school books, and watched her start on what she'd call her homework. She copied some letters in one of her notebooks, muttering to herself as she did so. The object, it seemed, was to tie up certain groups of letters with certain objects. She did the same thing when she strung groups of letters into words. I realized, of course, that she was learning to read and write. I knew from my time at the pet shop that written and printed matter was part of human's life. But it had never interested me. Why should it? Golden hamsters needed no written or printed matter to lead a full life, or so I thought in these days. At first, though, as I watched Sophie and I and figured out how writing worked, I merely found it intriguing. You made a few strange marks on paper, and they meant something. For instance, Anyone who knew the series of letters for Mealworm and read them would have a mental picture of one of those yummy little creatures. Fantastic, I thought. Learning to read struck me as far more, far from difficult. In Sophie's school book, there were pictures with groups of letters beside them. From the book of it, from the look of it, the T-R-E-E -E group of letters referred to a picture of a tree. Sure enough, Sophie traced those letters with her finger and said, tree. So. T-R-E-E -E meant tree. For exper experimental purposes, I watched her string together groups of letters and their meanings. No problem. In fact, I sometimes worked them out even before she did. Sophie! Gregory had entered the room. What is it, Daddy? I have to go out for a bit. If John shows up before I get back, can you give him this list of the points we have to settle? Ask him to get started on them? Sophie took the sheet of paper and looked at it. Uh, but I can't read this yet. You don't have to. Just give it to him, okay? He'll know what it is. Sophie nodded and Gregory went out. As for me, I sat on Sophie's desk with my ears pricked, absolutely transfixed. I was thunderstruck because I had suddenly grasped why humans use writing and printing to tell each other things. Gregory wanted to say something to John, but because he wouldn't be there, he wrote it down instead. Likewise, if that something was printed, it conveyed a message to all who read it. This realization seems positively silly to me now, as I write these words, but at the time, it took my breath away. Being the kind of individual I am, I promptly pursued this line of thought. It occurred to me how useful the art of reading could be to a golden hamster on the move, outing, on the move outside of his cage. Not just on Sophie's desk, I mean, but farther away. So far away that it then defied my powers of, of imagination. What if, in that far off place, I came across a package that might possibly contain hamster food. If it bore the series of letters that meant litter, I would know it at once and need not to go to the trouble of identifying the contents of by gnawing a hole in, into it. That, incidentally, would also make a noise, and you didn't even have to have the imagination of a mealworm to know that trips outside your cage might present situa situations in which noise could be dangerous. So how about it? Was there any reason why not? None, as far as I could tell. So I decided to learn to read.